All right. Okay, we're good. Um, <clears throat> let me list a few administrative things just to kick off since there's a lot of things going on. Um, we know that the drop date is Thursday, so people are thinking about their grades. We've done our best. I, I would say <laughs> Rachel and Danny have done their best. Thank you uh, for, for uh, to grade as many of the um, PSETs as we could possibly do. They should be, all the grades should be available to you on Gradescope. You get emails, I guess, most of the time that they're released. Um, and the rubric is on the website, and there's, you know, the percentages should line up. There's no intention to curve. Um, so you should have a good sense of where you're at. If you have questions, of course, you can ask. Um, <coughs> We have our project face-to-face -face meetings this week. I'm excited to see your faces and talk about the project. Um, that's my number one goal. I mean, I sent in the post, just uh, some basic instructions. You know, come and tell us, sh show us a few pictures, talk us through them and tell us how things are going. Use it as a chance to ask us questions. If you're stuck on anything, uh, we wanna make sure we're helping you as much as possible and that you're still on track. Uh, if there's any, if you have a, a big team and you wanna you know, give, help us understand if everybody's able to contribute. I think that's an important thing that I would like to look out for. <clears throat> um, in general, I think some of you are asking lots of good questions um, on Stack Overflow. I think a lot of them are private. You guys don't realize how many questions are getting answered uh, all, but there's lots of good questions. Um, keep them coming. Uh, some of you are asking them on Stack Overflow, which I, I actually really appreciate and love. I mean, I think um, and they've, some of them have gotten, some of those have gotten extremely good answers. So uh, don't be shy asking uh, on, the, on the main Drake forum. I think that's um, incredibly good for, in general, just having more sort of open documentation and, and uh, community building for that. And you also get more people answering questions because, uh, uh, you know, they're on, someone's there answering most of the time. <coughs> And uh, the, the last thing that I guess we haven't said, but we sort of decided is that uh, logistically uh, with 50-some uh, uh, groups, we're gonna do the videos again for the final project presentation rather than the live presentation. I think it's actually worked incredibly well. It was one of the good things that came out of uh, you know Zoom semesters, I think, is um, being able to have something, an artifact that you can look back at and, and share and other things is a, is a great thing. Uh, and also avoiding the switching uh, laptop uh, conundrum is nice. So, so we're gonna go, go for that again. Um, we we'll still have the last day allocated for it. I've actually reserved the room for longer. Uh, we'll have a viewing session. So it counts as one lecture from, from the time we get together, but we'll, we'll watch as many of them as we can. And we'll give you all the details on the website about exactly the time durations and, and how to post and everything like that. Lots of small things, but uh, any questions about the administrative stuff? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so we started, I kind of gave the prelude last week to reinforcement learning, talking about visual motor. Uh, and this week we'll squarely focus on reinforcement learning uh, in two parts. So, um, Part one today, we're gonna to talk about mostly sort of the policy gradient view of uh, reinforcement learning. And then, um, and I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna emphasize sort of a few of the core ideas, I think, and maybe not even the most commonly discussed ideas, but the ones that I think are most relevant to manipulation and that are coming up in our, in our research, <clears throat> okay? Some of the important ideas of thinking about it as a black box optimization some of the important things that happen when we add stochasticity to the formulation. Okay, we'll talk through those. Thursday, we're actually um, gonna have a guest lecture from Abhishek Gupta, who's fantastic. He's, he's a recent uh, graduate from uh, Peter Abiel and Sergey Levine's group. He's done lots of reinforcement learning on real robots doing manipulation. So he's gonna give you a very sort of applied RL view and what does it take to do RL with real data in the real world on Thursday. So I think that'll be very good. And he'll build off this, uh, talk about the actor critic and the Q learning variety. <coughs> good. Okay, so let's, um, let's start talking about RL. What is reinforcement learning? It means a lot of things to a lot of people. The 
scope of what you might call a reinforcement learning algorithm uh, is a dynamic uh, object and, uh, and it, it grows uh, uh, aggressively, I would say. For me, um, RL is a set of methods that are trying to solve the control problem. So the, the diagram you will always see here in every sort of RL talk or book or whatever is that you have an environment, you have an agent, sometimes that's agent, you know, and we're doing, we're just trying to close the loop with, an, uh, with the environment, okay? But I think what defines RL for me, which is a, maybe slightly narrower than it's broadly used these days, is the idea that we're gonna assume <coughs> the environment the, you know, the world, the plant, is a black box. So you get to run experiments on the environment, you get to send in actions and get observations out, but you don't get to know the full detailed equations of the environment. Um, you don't get to explicitly take gradients of it. You don't get to know it's convex. You don't get to do any of the stuff that we've been trying to emphasize, okay? Um, <clears throat> and there's a, there's a couple key ideas about policy gradient and, uh, and Q functions and value functions that are, I would say, defining in the sense of RL. Uh, but this, I think, first idea is um, treating the world as a black box. And I think another key idea is that they are almost always, RL almost always leverages stochastic optimal control as opposed to the deterministic um, formulations, okay? For algorithmic reasons, and we'll see, I think, important reasons for, uh, for the success of the algorithms. Okay, so, you know, last time we started talking about the visual motor policies, right? Which is just so good and so awesome that we can finally, you know, take a full camera input and think about possibly, you know, blocking it off a little bit and, and having a smaller pipe that comes down to a controller that we, that we think about with, with our RL tools, but still this pipeline that takes images straight through to actions um, and in a feedback loop is just so good and so powerful. And, you know, we sh I, I really became completely convinced when we were, saw we were doing these experiments, right? Um, this very, very, I think, compelling, robust behavior, at least local to the demonstrations, but where you could prod and push and, and um, you know, watch the robot interact with the world in a much more reasonable way, okay? Um, but last time we did visual motor policies with behavior cloning, and today we'll try to talk about some of the underpinnings, you know, you know can we find those policies with RL? So um, I actually want to start, it's, it's been very fun for me to, uh, for all of us, I think, to read the feedback that you give on the problem sets. Those of you that are continuing to give uh, good feedback, we appreciate it. Uh, many of you keep asking about, you know, don't, don't forget to throw in some software examples and the like. So um, I actually want to start a little bit with sort of this, um, talk a little bit about RL software, okay? and. <clears throat> Um, it's actually progressed quite a bit since this time last year, right? So I, this time last year, I was looking around at all the possible RL packages that I would sort of recommend or not recommend for, for the class, and it was, I was torn because there was kind of, a lot of them were in an intermediate state or something, but I think there's a lot of, there's some pretty good, um, more mature offerings this time, uh, and, I'm, and I'm pretty excited about that. So I, I feel sort of more confident recommending one or two specific things. Okay, so the first um, 
you know, I guess I forgot my uh, intro order, but let me forward past that for a second. Okay, the first bit of um, RL software that is has become sort of a, a the winning sort of format, I think, for specifying the environment half of, of this is the OpenAI gym. Many of you know this. Okay, so uh, there's a sort of standard Python interface, the gym environment, right, which asks you to define your RL problem, not the algorithm, but the problem, with us just by, by filling in a few simple callbacks, right? You have a basic an init method, a step method which takes your action, outputs the observations at the next step, advances your simulator, however you want to do that, a basic reset method, something to render just for the human or for making videos, which could be separate from the observations, okay? These are all, of course, very analogous to the things we have been using in, in Drake. This picture is not so different than a sort of systems view of the world, right? Um, so every one of those things has sort of a, an analogy in the tools we've been using, right? We have, we put our diagram builder inside the init, right? And our, and not just the diagram, but the simulator, right? Our step function is equivalent to advanced to in, in Drake speak, but it also has to return, um, you know, the evaluated observation, the evaluated reward, right? Reset just means start over, create a new context, probably a random context, actually. Um, <clears throat> and those sort of all, I think it pretty, I mean, this is what's been great about the OpenAI gym is that this is, asks very little of, uh, you know, of the interface and it's very easy to populate, whether it's from a game engine or from an, you know, like an Atari game or, a, or all kinds of problems are easy to sort of cast in that framework. But I also think it's very telling maybe to, to think about just the difference, it, the, the different sort of view. And maybe it's one of the best ways to express, um, you know, my mixed feelings about, about RL, right? Is that, um, you know, this picture of the world is, is general enough to be used for, for everything, right? And that API, you can put sort of anything beyond, behind it, right? But if you contrast that with sort of the Drake systems framework that I've been advocating, where the goal in Drake has been to expose everything, not, not to bottle up everything. I, I, this is, I mean, this is really a sort of a philosophical difference, and I don't, it's not clear if one's better or, or worse yet, right? Um, but there's a philosophical difference where, um, you know, I believe that the systems are very structured. Right? I think our mechanics is very structured. I think our controllers are very structured. I think you should do everything in your power to express that structure in a clean way and allow your algorithms to dig in and exploit the structure when, it, when they can and, uh, right, and make that as glass box, you know, clear box as possible, right? And the RL approach is, is more general, but it's weaker in the sense that it doesn't ask you to, to, to declare those things. It only assumes a black box. And that's a philosophical difference, right? And so, um, I actually, uh, this week, I've been trying to make sure, make sure there's a nice interface available for you to, if you have a Drake system, you can use the OpenAI tools and, and things like this. So um, it's easy to go back and forth, and I'll show you that in a second. But, um, but it sort of pains me <laughs> to, to do it. Not, I mean, of course, I want to be able to, to enable both. But I feel like, you know, we've, dr we've tried to, expose all this beautiful structure, write all the, all the diagrams and all the systems in a way that sort of like, if they're convex, they're convex, or whatever. And then, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we're gonna let you look at them through a, through a little drinking straw, right, in order to, um, to do the algorithms. And you're not, it's not leveraging the extra work that has, has happened behind the scenes. So I would say that's the only, I actually love, I, I do, I mean, really like RL. I think RL is the, um, clearly the most exciting thing you know, that's happening, I think, right now. There's, it's generating the most excitement right now. Um, and even my thesis, that's what this fl funny slide was before, my thesis was actually in RL, right? So this was um, in 2003, probably this one, where I was in building E25, back when the neuroscientists were in E25. And because I was in a neuroscience lab, um, and I was trying to build robots, 
I had to like bring a CD rack shelf from home. <laughs> and someone needed a piece of rubber, so I, I only had one piece of rubber. I, wasn't, I was working on a shoestring budget, right? But uh, this was a little walking robot that just fell down a ramp. There's no motors, no RL there. You know, and then my thesis was about making a robot do RL in the wild, right, sort of, and learn uh, quickly to learn how to walk. And this was the actuated version of that simple robot. And I spent a lot of hours watching that thing do gradient descent, um, you know, with kind of a, you're trying to write your thesis and you're hearing, <laughs> everyone's over here. <laughs> yeah, but, but, uh, uh, no, I mean, it, this, is, this was defining for me to think about um, uh, what you could do with, with online learning. And I think, and even in my, I, my job talk, to get the job at, uh, you know, when I went around giving my faculty candidate talks, I was saying, um, even if we could solve the optimal control problem perfectly for humanoid robots, you would still need online learning to adapt to all the changes that are gonna happen in the world. And I still believe that. Okay, so this little robot, you know, basically fell down a ramp because of the mechanical design, but then it learned how to walk um, using RL that was doing policy gradient based, actually a, a, an actor critic based algorithm that was, um, you know, learning to walk in real time. It took only a few minutes to learn how to walk because the design put it in a space where it could tune only a, a very small policy at that time. Um, and it would adapt on the fly as it would walk around. This was you know, walking from E25 towards the Media Lab was like the crowning achievement because it wasn't a very big robot, right? And uh, uh, right around that time when they were shooting that, that video, um, Marvin Minsky walked by um, and, and he looked down at the robot and he looked at the camera crew that was behind the robot. He's like, I think the camera is more impressive than the robot. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I cried myself to sleep that night, but, um, <laughs> But I was still proud of the robot, right? Anyway, so, so this was defining for me. I really, um, I think a lot about RL, um, but I think that there is a fundamental, um, you know, sample complexity issue and the, the amount of training data that you need to do the types of algorithms we'll talk about today. And so I have been trying to contribute to trying to do, you know, exploit the structure in the equations more. Okay, so there's this open AI gym. It exists, I think, um, you can, you can use anything that's sort of a, a system in Drake can be a, a system in, um, in OpenAI Gym. And similarly, you could take any OpenAI Gym system and use it in Drake. You just wouldn't, won't be able to use all of the gradient and other features in Drake if you do that. Um, so I made this Drake Gym. What many people have done, Drake wrappers around, um, or, you know, exposing the Gym interface around Drake, but I tried to make sort of one that you could build off of for your projects if you want this. Um, so it just goes through and defines all of those carefully. It's actually, uh, I think it's important to do it right. I mean, there's, there's, there's um, sort of right ways to reinitialize the simulator to get everything seeded properly off a single random seed and the like, but it's all very easy to do. So that's available if people want it. Okay, and like I said, Back in the day, so this is so, so the OpenAI gym is for the um, environments, and this has been relatively, you know, convergent. There's, most people are using the, the AI gym interface for some time now, but for the algorithms, you know, there are lots of good tools out there, um, and I would say they're they're even more mature this year, right? So um, the one that I would that I will use and be using in the notes as I write them up this, this week is the um, stable baselines three as an example. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're using PyTorch in the class. It's, it uses PyTorch. Some of the other uh, baselines algorithms are still using TensorFlow and so it's harder for me to use uh, alongside the notes without having more dependencies and the like. It's got a lot of the famous algorithms implemented, right? It, it strikes me that this isn't the best advertising. You know, the, the, the particular lots of red that they put here is a little scary, but, um, but there's still some good check marks and, uh, and then it's honest, right? But there are a lot of the algorithms that work for a lot of cases, okay? 
So this has got many of the RL algorithms. Uh, I guess I already wrote algorithm there. Um, <coughs> And then there's one other tool that I think is incredibly good that uh, we've used a bunch, which is um, this NeverGrad tool. I see how my slides are not quite there. For some of the black box optimization, which is not, um, not purely RL, it's for sort of a broader view of this. NeverGrad has a bunch of, um, of good algorithms and we'll use that too. NeverGrad meaning no gradients, right, for black box optimization. Okay, so let's dig in and talk a little bit about the black box, the implications of black box optimization and sort of why it's good and why it's um, expensive in some ways, okay? Okay, so I've been advocating multi, you know, many times sort of to think about our manipulation problems through the lens of optimization. The general form of that is something like this, right? In many cases, um, many algorithms we've used, like the solvers in SNOPT, or if you've used any of our MOSEC or Garobi sort of tools, exploit some structure in F and G, right? The weakest form, the, the sort of snopped or the general nonlinear optimization, uh, maybe it's just asking for the gradients, right? Um, you know, some of the more advanced algorithms from Mosek and Garobi will ask, you know, if you can say that this is quadratic or it's, some, it's convex in some structured convex form, you know, it's similar the, for these constraints to be a convex set, um, then you can, you can level even more uh, advanced algorithms at, at it, okay? So what we're gonna go to today is just a simpler form. We're gonna minimize f of x and assume almost nothing about f, okay? We're not even gonna assume it's a, I mean, in some, and we'll start off by assuming f is even a deterministic function, but there's gonna be versions of this where you, can, you won't even assume that you get the same answer every time you put an x in, okay? So uh, when I think of this, this as a black box, I'm saying that I give you an x, you give me f of x out, and that's it. I don't get to ask any more detailed questions. Don't get to know anything about what's happening behind the scenes. It could be calling a you know, game engine. It could be playing Go. Um, doesn't matter. Okay, so in this view of the world, I'm gonna erase that just to stay on the same boards here. In this view of the world, we had some really nice algorithms, right? So for instance, um, if I, if I had some complicated um, optimization problem, right? We had the simplest versions would be gradient descent. Right, I get a point here, I start moving down the landscape. We talked about sort of Newton-like or quasi-Newton algorithms. Or the quadratic programming 
um, generalization of that, sequential quadratic programming, which maybe every, if I have a sample point here, what I would do would be use some of the gradient information to make a local quadratic approximation of the function, jump right down to the minimum, right? Get a new sample point, jump right down, okay? And, and eventually converge on the minimum. So if I tell you now that you can assume almost nothing about f, right? We, we don't actually even want to assume it's, the, it's smooth, but we will, I think our pictures will, will indicate it's smooth for now just to get our head around the problem, okay? Um, then what kind of optimization are you, are you left with? I mean, <clears throat> in a one-dimensional board example, you could just sample until you find a good solution and be done, okay? But in high dimensions, we're thinking that's probably not, it's harder to draw, but it's, it's important to think about this as sort of a high dimensional object, right? And just trying every point until you find a good one, uh, brute force search isn't gonna get the job done, right? So how do you do something like gradient-based optimization when you only have a black box, right? And you can imagine that almost most of the ideas over here have sort of a sampling-based analogy, right? Which is, it's in, in many ways, not so different than what we talked about with kinematic trajectory optimization versus sample-based motion planning. There's actually a lot of, um, of nice parallels between those two worlds and the two worlds we're doing today, okay? <clears throat> but um, maybe the simplest algorithm, gradient-like algorithm, would be if I take my random sample, perturb it by some amount. So let's say I have my guess that the i-th step is xi. You have um, f of xi. Um, try to go ahead and evaluate f of xi plus some small perturbation. So I'll make a little perturbation here, w, okay. I'll get a different, different point. Maybe that's just drawn from some Gaussian, okay? I'll just pick a, make a small random change to my parameters w in some direction. And the simplest algorithm, I think, would just be to say, if this value is less than this value, keep it. You know, use that as my new point, and then we'll, we'll wash, rinse, and repeat. You know, if it went uphill, discard it, okay? Maybe a slightly more refined version of that could be to say that I will move in the direction of this point proportional to the reward I got, the relative reward, right? So if this looked a lot better, I'll move aggressively in the direction of that sample point. And maybe even if it went up, I could move somehow in the opposite direction based on this. So there's a sort of a first order sample-based approximation. Okay. But there's also, you can imagine, you know, second order methods or richer methods, right, that are doing sort of the same thing. This, I, I, I'm highly positive about the SQP style optimization. I think it's a very powerful fast converging you know, set of algorithms. And you could imagine taking my initial sample point and taking lots of random samples. Again, the picture is not fully expressive in 2D on the board, but you can imagine trying to take lots of samples around here. Uh, maybe I explore broadly and then fit a, co uh, uh, I almost said covariance, but let's, let's call it a quadratic, fit a quadratic fit 
to samples and then do sort of something like a quasi-Newton um, descent, right? Okay, and this turns out to be a very powerful um, you know, class of algorithms, this, this general idea of trying to use samples to approximate um, you know, some of the ty other types of algorithms that we like. There are other considerations too that make sampling in a, in a nice uh, choice, right? So let's just think about for a minute about sort of what's the relative merits of, of a sampling based approach versus the, uh, the, tr the exact gradient sort of based approach. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I mean, first of all, the sampling only requires that's easy, right, f of x doesn't require the actual gradient. I think there's a question of how expensive is evaluating f of x versus partial f of x part if you have it. Right? That's definitely a consideration. Sometimes uh, it can be, you know, uh, it can be so much faster to implement, you know, if, if, if taking gradients is, is, is quite slow, then it might actually be better to just run f a bunch of times separately. I remember um, Emo Todorov uh, going back and forth with this from Majoko. He was, he was like, you know, one day I would talk to him, he's like, oh yeah, I wrote all the analytical gradients. And then he's like, oh no, I realized this is just faster, you know, because I could put it on a GPU. And he went back and forth. So um, there was a time where he had all the analytical gradients and I think he's mostly gotten rid of them. Um, right. Another sort of important consideration, like how many GPUs, how big is your GPU, right? How many threads, how many GPUs? Because doing lots of samples of f can be sort of trivially parallelized. And if, if that is, uh, you know, expensive, but not as expensive as, you know, it, if, it's, if it's free to make this in parallel, then maybe it's cheaper, again, than the partial f, partial x. And that's a big one. You know, I think the, the success of these methods is tied, I think, very closely with the fact that we've got good GPUs and the like now. Okay. <clears throat> But there is more subtle reasons that I really want to, um, to think about, okay? So more, I think, robustness reasons, okay? So what if, what if your cost function looks like something like this, right? Right? If there's a lot of sort of local noisy structure um, that happens in your optimization, okay? The, the gradient is a beautiful object, of course, but it's, you know, for better or for worse, it's extremely local object, right? If I happen to sample this point, I might get instantaneously a gradient that looks like that um, just because of the high frequency components of my, of my landscape. And that could be a very, poor representation of what I actually, the direction I actually want to move in. Right? So I think there is um, some robustness in actually taking multiple samples. Of course, it could still be susceptible to 
noisy evaluations, but somehow the sampling-based thing uh, can potentially power through some noisy, uh, you know, locally noisy observations. <clears throat> so I think there's a very deep question that I don't have an answer for you for. I've seen examples uh, that look a lot like this, and I've seen examples that look more like those simple pictures coming out of manipulation. But I think there's a deep question, which is, do our manipulation problems look like this or not? Do the problems we care about solving and control, more generally, look like this or not? Right? Um, I think for the low dimensional problems where it's easy to plot these things, I, I, don't, I don't worry too much that it, it does. But in the high, higher dimensional, much richer sort of contact kind of configurations, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what those look like. Like I said, I've seen examples where we're like, oh, clearly the performance of our algorithm is suffering because of something like this, and then you plot them and they're actually pretty smooth, right? I think that there's other examples like um, people tend to use sample-based, these sampling-based methods sometimes to optimize um, neural network-based models, right? And so you think, well, maybe the neural network is, is capturing the function correctly, but it's locally not very smooth, right? And that, I think that is probably true in some cases. But we've seen other cases where we do our best to visualize them and they look pretty smooth. Yes? Good question. So um, when, I, when I say we try to, we've checked sometimes and, and have looked at this in higher dimensions, what do you do? Um, the tools are not as strong as I would like, but a, a standard heuristic would be take your sample point, pick a random direction, and make a 2D plot, right? And if you do that you know, a few times, you can sort of convince yourself of the local, local shape, even if you can't say anything rigorously about it, right? There's a, yeah, I think in general, the sense of, of to taking small, uh, sort of uh, probes into the neural network, for instance, yeah. Yeah, okay, so the question is, um, you know, do you expect to see this uniformly everywhere, like this high frequency stuff, or just in pockets? I would, I think it's completely problem dependent, and I would suspect in a lot of our manipulation formulations, right, if I'm, I've got a huge swath of parameter space where I don't even touch an object, right? And then there's some, some parts where like the detailed mechanics are coming in and it's, it's much more complicated that it's probably gonna be, you know, smooth sailing but maybe uninformative for a lot of places and then a lot of activity in other places. I would definitely think that's true. Which makes it hard to set global learning rate parameters and the like, right? Okay, um, <clears throat> so this is, I think, an, a, a very important point. And I, I really do think that this number of sort of parallel executions is a, is a very important point, too. Um, but of course, uh, the most naive version of this, uh, of, of sort of a sampling algorithm, would say that every time I want to make a local approximation of my gradient, I'll take n samples, where n is the dimensionality of my parameter space. So basically, I'll change I'll perturb the, you know, the variable, the decision variables in every possible direction, at least once. That'd be like a finite difference type method, right? And if you're doing that, then you'd expect potentially the number of possible evaluations that you have to do uh, in F in parallel to grow very badly if, you're, um, you know, if your number of Xs is like the weights of a neural network. Like you would expect that to start get bad, getting bad, okay? Um, so there's ways to try to fight against that. You know, and then the question is, do you have a super, a super good um, you know, gradient-based, for neural networks, we do have very good gradient uh, algorithms, right? So, so these two do fight each other, and they fight it, each other in interesting ways as the dimensionality goes high. Okay. Now, there's another name for these sort of black box uh, sampling-based algorithms, which, um, for a while, was uh, was sort of uh, you know a, a bad thing, a bad word, or something like this. I don't know, but these are really the genetic algorithms, right? They were not as popular before, right? Or swarm-based optimization, let's say. Okay. 
Okay, but I think, like I said, because of the ability to do these things in parallel, and I think because of these nice robustness properties, they've come back into fashion. So <clears throat> the one that is most similar to this picture that I said of trying to make a local quadratic approximation of my, uh, of my data and then doing a quasi-Newton update uh, is, is an algorithm called CMAES. I mean, there's, there's a lot, these, all these algorithms are pretty similar, or there's many algorithms that are, are very small variations on each other. So cross entropy methods are pretty similar to this too, but I'll highlight CMAES here, right? So CMA stands for covariant matrix adaptation. It's often with an ES evolutionary strategy. Okay. As we've said before, the, um, the probabilistic interpretation would be that you're trying to fit a co the covariance matrix of, your, of a Gaussian kernel, but that's the same as fitting a quadratic form for a quasi-Newton method, okay? And this is just sort of a, uh, a picture of if you actually do um, try to do a simple optimization, if you're on a, a simple quadra quadratic landscape and you start with a swarm of particles, you'd expect the, um, the in fact, in the, in the simple case of it being a quadratic, you actually expect that the, um, the local covariance matrix approximation will indeed reproduce the Hessian of the quadratic form. So the second order, it's, it's an accurate second order approximation um, of, the, of the quadratic form. You get a new covariance matrix, you have a new Gaussian to sample from, which tells you where I should draw samples on the next update, wash, rinse, and repeat, and it will converge to sort of some local. There's an additional scheduling and other sort of um, heuristics inside there to, about the, the path that it takes given these, these uh, approximations, but roughly it's, it's what we say, it's a quasi-Newton method that's trying to use um, you know, swarms of particles to estimate the local curvature and, and move down the, down the hill. Is that clear? There's another feature of these algorithms that I think is um, important, often sort of mixed in with this local convergence analysis. So in a quadratic form, you can really sort of focus in on the convergence rate. You can talk about all the things we would like to talk about with gradient descent or other optimization algorithms. You can talk about, you know, it's just converging to a local minima. If you're in the vicinity of a local minima, you'd like it to behave roughly like this. Okay, but there's also some, um, some sort of global aspect to the sampling-based algorithms. Some sort of global optimization lands, um, interpretation. And this is, I think, harder to appreciate rigorously, right? Even in my simple picture where I've, you know, if I were to, to do even the, the completely deterministic quadratic approximation of my Hessian and make a quasi-Newton update, it could be, if I'm sorry to be a school over here, yeah. it could be that as I'm walking down here, I get a, a quasi-Newton step that jumps me all the way across and finds this better local minima, right? That can actually, absolutely, it can even happen with gradient descent if I'm taking big steps, right? But it's maybe more likely to happen in a quasi-Newton algorithm, which is intentionally taking potentially very big steps. It could have gotten lucky and gotten here. That can absolutely happen for the same reason in the evolutionary algorithms, uh, in the CMA style algorithms. But these algorithms, because they're doing samples, um, will often, have some extra layers of heuristics that try to add a global aspect to their optimization. They'll cast off far-ranging samples, maybe, for instance, in, in, and just explore, you know, it, it costs little to throw out a few uh, Hail Marys out there to see if they can find another 
um, another possible minima, right? And so they do tend to have a more global success. I'd say they, they, they can find global optimal in a stronger way than a method that's dedicated itself to sort of myopically looking at the local curvature, right? So, so these, there's a, so I think, somewhat confusing but important global aspect to the global optimization as aspect to the sample-based planning algorithms. And people talk, you know, I think there's a big discussion about, you know, should we be using these algorithms to do planning with a neural network or whatever? And I think there's a, you know, why does it work? I often see people going back and forth between these kind of justifications, the parallel execution type of justifications, the global optimization aspect. They're all mixed together in some, in some way, okay? But if you put them all together, this has now become, come back into fashion as a, as a, as a good set of algorithms to use. Just to say that one more possible way, right? If I have a, um, a gradient descent type algorithm that's using sort of local gradients, we said that there's, and I'm just trying to be like, I'm a vehicle flying around some obstacles and going from the start to the goal, or I'm reaching around some obstacle, and this is the current path that I'm, I'm um, considering, right? It seems very unlikely with gradient-based methods that it'll, it'll suddenly uh, find a completely different solution. Right? That's the same picture. This is just a geometric version of the same picture, but in a trajectory optimization sort of case, you really don't expect gradient descent, to any information over here, to ever tell you to jump over here because at some point you're going to do worse for a long time before you get better and go to the other side. And I think these algorithms will occasionally send flyers out there and find an ultimately better solution uh, in ways that you don't expect sort of your gradient-based methods to, to do. Question? Yeah, of course. Would you expect an algorithm of this type to be more robust? So like, I'm imagining a case where you are trying to optimize some policy and it finds a very deep but very shallow or very narrow yes. optimum. Yep. But then if you try to run that on a real robot, the odds are actually within that same frame that you're thinking about. Would an algorithm like this be more robust at finding an optimum like that? Awesome question. So, so the, the, the question was, you know, what if I have these sort of landscapes that maybe have uh, you know, a small, narrow optimization. I mean, you could also, you can do the same thing where you could have a, a narrow local minima that's maybe, you know, a trap, for instance. That's not, not the one you want to end up in, right? Both, you, I think the case of the good solution being narrow is one case, and the case of a suboptimal solution being narrow is another case. I think these algorithms, they are both subject to um, possibly getting stuck there. Um, in practice, the algorithm is just like a learning rate. They'll, they have a handful of parameters that control how much exploration versus how fast they converge and how fast they settle. And when you feel like your algorithm is getting stuck in these, you dial up the heat um, in, a, you know, in a sort of entropy kind of way um, you know, and, uh, and try to explore a little bit more and, uh, and you end up finding a balance there. But that is again, very problem specific. I, you know, do you expect, did you have some intuition about whether you'd expect one to be better th uh, or worse than the other? My intuition is that if you're sampling the nearest more robust, if you have like a very narrow value of good cost, yes. right, and you're like sampling around the limit of that, and then ignoring the narrow one. Right, so, so what, I think what could happen with an algorithm like this, he, he says, you know, the, for the same reason I said, if it's sending out flyers, maybe, you know, if it, if it starts converging with a local quadratic approximation that's like very narrow in here, okay, then that's where, you know, if at some point it will actually get in convergence mode and try to efficiently, you know, but if it will, if it occasionally throws out these sort of um, extra samples, it might discover that it's, done, it's made a mistake and jump out, and I agree with you on that. Um, but that's gonna be subject, to the, the amount of exploration versus exploitation it does is subject to these sort of temperature kind of parameters. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think um, 
So, so there are many variants of it. So it'd be interesting if you have that paper, if you want to track down the reference, I'd actually be interested in, in that. Um, yes, some of them keep multiple populations, right, uh, around and can be sort of more explicitly multimodal. Um, some of them really do just have more um, feelers out there in some, in some sense. Uh, but I think the, the inner loop CMAES, you know, is really this sort of covariance, you know, makes local Gaussians and will, um, will shrink into a, a minima as necessary, right? The, the cross entropy methods, you know, which are, I think, n known to some of you, are very similar to CMAES. They make a slightly different, they take a slightly different path, sort of, and the way they update their Hessian, local Hessian approximations is slightly different, but these are all very similar algorithms. Okay, so that is a very important first big thing that's happening, I think, when you, um, when you give up on the structure in F, you open the, the door to these algorithms making a lot more sense. You know, and maybe, maybe they make sense even if you have structured F, but you just have a really big GPU, right? And that's the way the, the cost-benefit trade-off falls. Uh, I meant, I'm pretty sure I had the Nevergrad list of solvers here, too, yeah. And Nevergrad is the is a toolbox that just has a bunch of these solvers implemented, super easy to use in Python, and it's got, you know, a whole list of cross, uh, of, of these sort of optimization algorithms that are all based on no gradients, hence never grad. Okay, I think it's a very, I have no, <coughs> no qualms recommending this as a, as a tool to play with. We've used it often. Okay, I think that's one, that's the first sort of major shift in thinking. Well, I should say one thing we didn't talk about yet is I, when I went from the left side of the board to the right side of the board, I dropped my constraints, okay? So um, that is an important thing that, that I left out. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the structured solvers I've always advocated using fairly simple, um, fairly simple objectives and rich constraints, right? That's, I think, a much more robust way to sort of live. <laughs> um, always said, you know, keep this simple in our kinematic optimization, our IK problems, for instance, we, I was just saying, you know, just do Q, to Q minus desired squared, something like this, right? Keep that simple and then add all your rich constraints. Not everybody agrees with me on that, but I've seen lots of people go down so spend a lot of time tuning cost functions when everything's up in the cost function and the constraints are just a, I think a much more, um, it's a stronger way to say, say what you actually uh, require and then a lot of the tuning goes away. Um, <clears throat> Nevergrad explicitly says uh, you can only do, it's actually better than many um, uh, sort of sample based methods, but the, it, it says we're only gonna let you give us uh, computationally very cheap constraints. It's like the method is actually like add cheap constraints uh, to, your, to your solver because the only thing it will do is do rejection sampling, right? So if you give it an, if it's walking around and you give it an X, it'll just evaluate G if it's less than, if it violates the constraints, it throws that sample out. That's the only re method of constraint reasoning that these solvers typically do. Um, and there is not, uh, these algorithms do not typically embrace, uh, you know, the rich constraints. You end up playing the game where you say, I'm gonna minimize f of x plus like lambda times g of x, uh, for instance, if I want g of x, or maybe minus, or uh, whatever my sign should be. And you start putting a penalty approximation of a true constraint.
guess I do have a three plus. And there are good ways to schedule this, um, that, that penalty parameter, but it's, it becomes a harder game because really what you're, you're doing is something that looks a lot more like this. Right, and, uh, and you've got lots of knobs to tune and they all kind of compete, okay? Some people worry a lot about RL not embracing the full constraint view of the world and being all, only in this jam everything into the cost function. Uh, some people think it's not a big deal, right? I'm somewhere in the middle, I'd say. Okay, let's talk about, I think, another essential aspect, which is goes together with the black box optimization. By virtue of, of feeling like we're gonna do sampling anyways, um, it's natural to couple that with uh, with stochastic formulations of the optimal control problem. Yeah, sure. in terms of the black box solvers? Yeah. So I'll repeat the question. So <clears throat> it's certainly true that you can take any optimization problem here and I could write that as um, S f of x less than or equal to S g of x less than or equal to zero. If you just try to push down on an S, this is a scalar and then uh, maybe you have to so, so th those are equivalent. But that's putting things m more from the objective down into the constraint, not going the other way, right? Okay, so you're not worried about the penalty method. You're just worried about the basic statement about, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think these are, these ways, do not embrace what I'm trying to say here because you can tuck, you can hide your objective, of course, in the constraints, right? Um, I mean, this comes down, I think, to what your solver likes, uh, whether you prefer to write it like this or prefer to write it like this. And some solvers do actually really like this. Um, many times they require you to, a lot of the convex solvers, you know, uh, require you to write it like this in order to uh, write something as a semi-definite, if you have a quadratic objective in a semi-definite program, then you have to do something like this, for instance, right? Um, but I think uh, this is not, this is more of a, um, you could defeat this heuristic by writing constraints in such a way that they, uh, you had a very simple cost function and you still jammed all your penalties and stuff in the constraints. That's not what I mean, right? I'm saying like, if you don't wanna collide with the mug, say you don't wanna collide with the, uh, the mugs, not, not say, you know, I'd be kinda sad if I collided a bit with the mug, right? Um, I, did, I think this is a stronger thing to tell the solver. That's a good question. Okay, another really big uh, important thing is this sort of stochastic formulation of control. So stochastic optimal control is as old as optimal control. It's not an RL thing. but RL has embraced those formulations, okay? And let me just try to, um, you know, I'd say, I think it's, this is inspired in RL probably first by the practical, right? Um, on a real robot, frankly, I mean, even if you think of your robot as a black box that you can set your, set your control parameters, run an experiment, measure the outcome, uh, wash, rinse, and repeat, uh, you can never run the same experiment twice. I was acutely aware of that during my thesis. It was very hard to get the same, you know, the robot to be th the same initial conditions. Um, very hard to get repeatable data, even in the load uh, regime. You know, this is what experimental science is all about. You 
you know, I've had a little bit of, of um, I've had some really, really good collaborators in, in experimental fluid dynamics and the amount of effort that they put into, you know, making experiments as repeatable as possible, you know. And I can only imagine what the sort of condensed matter folks do and the like, right? And the roboticists just don't do that, <laughs> uh, right? You just, you just expect every time I run the salt, the, the robot, it's gonna be different. My, you know, my actuator's heated up. I didn't put it in the same initial conditions. It stepped on a pebble this time, whatever it is, right? And I think we've just embraced it in RL more than uh, in most other cases. So let's think about what the implication for that is, right? So um, how would I write this in the simplest form of a stochastic optimization? So I wrote min of x, f of x before, but now if f of x is some sort of uh, you know, random evaluation, there's a couple different ways I could write that. I'll choose to write it like this. I'll make the randomness explicit. So w is, for instance, drawn from some random distribution. Doesn't have to be Gaussian, but let's just say it, make that uh, explicit. And if w is a random variable and f depends on w, then my cost depend, is a random variable also. I need to take the expected value. I need to take some statistic of that random variable in order to make a scalar cost. And this is the one we almost always choose in, in stochastic optimal control because the expected value plays well with the additive cost formulations, okay? And this is very consistent with sort of what I've said before about the modeling choices in the systems framework, right, where I, um, we very explicitly, and, and throughout robust control, I'd say you, you'll see pictures that look like this, where you have your control inputs, you know, coming in here, and you have an explicit um, disturbance port or something like this. Disturbance input. Okay, so um, don't call rand in the middle of your plant dynamics function, make it very explicit. Okay, and then you can start thinking about it more carefully like this. Stochastic optimal control is um, a, ref, uh, a more specific version of this big picture where I know that I have a dynamical system. So this F is actually a rollout of a long-term dynamical system, right? So stochastic optimal control is just narrowing in on the sort of stochastic optimization problem where I wanna maybe <clears throat> minimize over, let's say my policy of my controller now of some long-term cost that's over time, okay? So I'll just write it out like this. Probably I have to choose where I want the randomness to come in. There's a couple different choices. It might be that there's randomness in the dynamics. We'll see that there's gonna be choices we, we make where we might add randomness explicitly to the policy, okay? But we still have a random disturbance input. Random noise or disturbance, and I'll take some expected value over those. Okay, so there's a lot of work specific in stochastic optimal control to exploiting this sort of um, important structure. But let's start by thinking of it just as a, um, now a, a stochastic optimal optimization problem. I mean, there's lots of places that people put in uh, randomness in our actual sort of manipulation uh, RL experiments, right? So. You can name them, I'm sure. What are the what are the ones you see in in uh, in all the online and all the videos? Like, what are the crazy things people do to add randomness to the simulation? 
Yeah. So you, okay, good. So you, you get the random disturbances where you're jamming something. Yeah. I've seen like people from Lost that are like. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Right. So like you know, the robots getting hit by all from all sides. Right. Uh, I mean, in Boston Dynamics, I guess they actually they do it for real. Yeah. I mean, I think the the one that just I always laugh at is the, is the domain randomization, right? Is the, where they uh, will put like the most ridiculous patterns on the, you know, for the, for the vision, for robustness in sort of the perception system. You know, the fact that you might have like an elephant on the side of your, uh, uh, you know, coffee mug or something like that, just, go, or a giraffe or whatever, just cracks me up. Okay, but these sort of uh, can all be interpreted in some, you know, uh, squinty way as adding some sort of randomness, random parameters to my, my system. They can, you know, in, if I'm allowing W to be an entire rich signal, it would be fine if it's just a constant. That would still fit in the class. Okay, so let's think through what it, how it changes the optimization problem to now have these stochastic objectives. Okay, and as a thought experiment, imagine I've got some manipuland on the table here that I'm trying to pick up. Got something on the table here. I've got my chunk coming down from above. Let me just consider, so I can plot things, you know, a very simple policy. Okay, we'll, we'll just move straight down. To height alpha, and then close the hand and then lift, right? Let's say that the cost function or the reward is just the height of the center of mass of the object. Manipulant. What is that going to look like? Maybe if I set my height of my, uh, my controller too low, then maybe I have a collision or something down here. So that maybe, a, maybe or maybe I just give a, a bad score if I have a collision with the hand. Right, and then maybe if I'm too high, you know, the height of the mug is somewhere over here, let's say I don't get any Point. I don't get any reward because the center of mass just stayed where it was, right? And somewhere in the middle here, I've got a, a plateau where I've made successful contact with my cylindrical mug and I, I lift up, okay? It's just a toy example of a kind of reward function that we might get when we have, you know, manipulation. We have the possibility of making contact, of colliding dramatically, of completely missing the object. You can often get these sort of pretty ugly, right, this does not look like these nice pictures that I showed before. Uh, it's not the kind of landscape you'd want to do sort of gradient descent on by default. Okay, so um, this is often not the problem that we try to formulate in RL, right? Uh, I'm gonna you know, draw giraffes on here and stuff, right? Um, but I'm also probably going to sh change the shape of the, of the mug, maybe change the initial positions of the, um, of the hand, right? And that can do good things, right? So if I ended up with, you know, even just a richer shape object, right? Maybe it's a, I don't know what that is, a chalice, um, right? Then maybe I've got a, a slightly better, a cost function, maybe I'm still in collision 
for a bunch of the time, but maybe there's some interesting times where I can grasp successfully. I, I fail in the middle, I, I grasp, I don't know. I could get something by just having a more interesting object, I could potentially have um, you know, more interesting cost functions. Okay? But that doesn't sort of defeat the problem of if I just airball, I've got nothing going on here. Having lots of samples down here, you know, that's just not going to give me any gradient information to, to base my search on. If I've got lots of samples over here, I've got nothing good to do. Okay, so <clears throat> it's very interesting to think that, I mean, you, you might think that if you're asking the same robot, the same policy, to pick up a whole variety of objects, that that would be a harder optimization problem. I would think that, right? I mean, that sounds like a harder optimization problem, like tune a robot to pick up a single object versus pick up an entire category of objects. You'd think that would be a bigger ask. But in sort of a gradient optimization landscape way, it can actually make things better, right? So imagine now that just I have a variety of different, um, well, let me even go back to it, uh, an even simpler example here. So the, the characteristic I care about here is these rough discontinuities. Right, so what about if I just bottle that up and think about like a very simple case of this? If I'm just trying to minimize some discontinuous function. This is the function that is one if x is greater than zero, negative one if, if x is less than zero. It's a nasty optimization problem for gradients, right? It's also a boring one because um, I guess there's a lot of uniquely good answers, but just if we think about its gradient-based properties. Randomness can make these problems better. Okay, so let's think of a small variation on that where I want to say min over x now, and I'll, I'll add noise in sort of the way I've indicated um, above here. Let's just say I'll do it like this. What does that optimization do? Right? What does that optimization look like? Okay, so what, what is your intuition for why that is? Uh, because the bigger x is, the smaller w has to be, the, the sign of x of w is positive, mm -hmm. so it should be increasing in x. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, right, so the bigger x is, then, it, then this can get smaller, right? So maybe if I were to plot uh, this, as somehow this might be my probability of, of uh, x plus w. Yeah. And so you're saying that, you know, as I make x bigger, then I'm going to get more of my Gaussian on there. And that's, ex that's exactly the right picture. Good. Right. So what I'll get, I think, I know, is, a, is actually a beautiful sort of smooth version of that original function. Right, that that Gaussian, you could think of this Gaussian as actually acting as a, Gauss, as a smoothing function that goes over your cost landscape and smooths things out. Okay, and gradient descent here has a much better chance of doing something interesting. What's super interesting is that I think a lot of the domain randomization that we're doing in RL is having a similar effect on the cost landscape that we're generating, right? So there's a more general interpretation of these ideas. Um, in stochastic optimization, you, there's a field of randomized smoothing. Okay. 
And in fact, um, many ways that you would choose to add noise to your simulation, right, uh, or, or to your policy or to whatever, you, a lot of different choices of W will have this interpretation that it'll take potentially a complicated landscape. I've got a fun one plotted up here from Terry, actually. Okay, this is just a, uh, Terry's way of thinking about this was, uh, to, he's trying to throw a ball over a wall, okay? And he's um, trying to maximize the, the distance, the final distance of the, of the ball. And the only control decision to make is sort of the angle at which you throw, okay? And it, for some small angles, you'll just land smoothly and you're, you'll get better and better scores, less, less cost here. At some point, you'll run into the wall, okay? All of these angles have exactly the same cost. And then suddenly you're over the wall, right? So you drop down. 45 is sort of the optimal solution, right? Is to throw it 45 degrees. At some point you throw too steeply and you actually hit the wall again because you went up and on the way down, okay? Yeah. And then. But if you were to just add some randomness, so if you took the policy parameters and you say, I'm gonna throw the ball at theta plus or minus some Gaussian. Right? So every time I throw it, I'll just throw it at theta plus some Gaussian. And I'll take the expected value of that cost instead. Then for sort of arbitrarily complicated landscapes, you end up with things that look much more amenable to gradient descent. And I think this is an essential part of what's making um, policy based, you know, gradient based methods work in, in RL. Okay, I've talked too slowly, I guess, I'm sorry. But um, let me see if I can uh, at least indicate one other um, important idea. Okay, so those are, I think those are maybe the two I really wanted to, to land first, right? One is that we're switched to black box optimization. The second is that I think these stochastic formulations really affect the success of a gradient-based method. All right, let me just, tell you what policy gradient is in a way that Abhishek can build on here, okay? So policy gradient in RL is not quite black box optimization, okay? So imagine if I have a function, um, Imagine I'm trying to do this, minimize over x, f of x. I'll leave this, the randomness out for just a moment just to make this point simple, okay? Imagine I have a nested function, okay? I have two parts of my system, two parts of, you know, the, of, the, of the cost function. Let's say this is something that is known, and I know partial g, partial x. So I have gradients on the inside, okay? And this is unknown, black box. Okay, so not surprisingly, this is gonna be my policy, right? This is gonna be my neural network. And this could be my dynamics and cost function. There's a lot of parameters in a neural network, right? You probably don't want to just randomly check all the parameters of a neural network. Well, there's, there, we can talk about when you do and when you don't want to do. It's actually, it's viable, but um, it seems like you'd like to leverage the fact that at least part of my gradients are, uh, are known, right? And this is the, the the key idea in the policy gradient algorithms basically is to, um, instead of adding, right, so there would be two approaches I could do if I wanted to do the random version of this. I could try to minimize something like this. I could add noise directly Or 
I can add noise to the output of my neural network, let's say. And if you do this second version, okay, in both cases, there's an interpretation where, you know, if, if x plus w was better than x, then I would like to make x plus w more likely to happen in the future. That's the basic gradient descent sort of, sort of story. If x plus w was, was um, you know, was better, make it more likely to happen. In this case, you say I've got a neural network outputting, you know, y equals g of x. If y plus w was better, I'd like to make y plus w more likely to happen in the future, and I can do that by using gradient descent on g. Okay, so the policy gradient suite of algorithms in RL is basically a combination of the black box optimization, which is leveraging the gradient of just the policy, hence the name. Right? It's often, I think, um, yeah, misused. The word policy gradient is often misused. Okay, but um, but I, I think that, in my mind, that's the key idea, is that you take the gradient of your policy, the true gradient of your policy, and you combine it with a noisy approximate gradient from sampling um, for the, the part you don't know. Okay? And you're, you're actually, I don't feel too bad, I think we've got a problem that, on the problem set that will help you explore the details of that with enough instructions that it'll be okay. Um, okay, but this is the, sort of the key idea in policy gradient. You can imagine if you have um, the additive structure from stochastic optimal control, then you can even be smarter about, uh, about sort of, you know, taking gradients through the chain, through the serial chain, and leverage the structure of the optimal control problem. And the more advanced algorithms in RL do that. That was a super, that was like the three minute version of a complicated topic, but is that, is that okay? Is that, does that, at that level, does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, so um, I will see many of you in face to face this week. Uh, some, if those of you that I'm going to meet in a few minutes, I'm happy to. I'm happy in general to meet in person. It's just there's a logistical problem of getting to the offices and stuff like that. But uh, most of you, I guess, I'll see on Zoom. Just for logistics.